stands for Coronavirus Infectious Disease 2019, and it is a clinical entity caused by the virus known as SARS-CoV-2. And SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus. We've known about coronaviruses for many, many years. They typically cause uh, the common cold. Uh, they can occasionally cause uh, pneumonia. But this is a new virus. It's a new coronavirus. It uh, causes more serious disease, uh, more serious cases of pneumonia. And basically, the whole world is susceptible to this uh, new virus because it only emerged late in 2019. It is transmitted through mostly droplets, large droplets. So when people speak or sing or cough or sneeze and they produce large droplets that usually land close to the body, that's why everyone refers to a two meter distance when we're uh, distancing, these large droplets are the droplets that transmit the virus, and they're mostly droplets of uh, saliva or respiratory secretions. That's the primary mode of transmission. It can also be transmitted through indirect contact. And when we say indirect contact, that means mostly contaminated surfaces. So if someone uh, touches his or her nose who is infected, and then touches, for example, uh, a surface, uh, a doorknob, uh, and then a susceptible individual does the same thing, touches that surface and then touches his or her nose, uh, mouth or eyes, then that's another way uh, some, uh, the, the virus can be transmitted. So that's called indirect contact transmission. And combined with droplet transmission, that probably accounts for 98% of the transmission of the virus. In very rare circumstances, it can be transmitted through what's called the airborne route. And airborne is typically reserved for those uh, viruses or bacteria that are uh, shed through the air but can remain suspended for very long periods of time and can travel relatively long distances. And they include, for example, measles, uh, chicken pox, uh, tuberculosis. And so SARS-CoV-2 when there is a procedure that aerosolizes respiratory secretions into very tiny, tiny droplets, like intubating a patient here at the hospital, well then that is a potential mode for transmission. But it is rare and it's uncommon, especially outside of hospitals. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. And that is a molecular test, nucleic acid amplification test that's used in labs all over the world. It's considered to be the gold standard for COVID diagnostics. It's used for other purposes as well. It's been around for many years. It is a very, very sensitive test to test for nucleic acid in uh, viruses or in bacteria or other pathogens. And then here in the hospital and in other clinical settings, PCR is used to uh, make a diagnosis in a, in a patient. So when a patient comes to the hospital in the emergency department, for example, and has signs and symptoms compatible with COVID-19, we use a PCR in order to make the diagnosis, to make a lab-confirmed diagnosis. It doesn't always work, however, when patients have pneumonia and you're sampling the nose or the nasopharynx because the virus has left that site and is now causing a disease in the lungs. And so occasionally we get negatives from a nose specimen when the patient actually has COVID pneumonia. The other issue is that it is sometimes uh, uh, what's called falsely positive or it's a late positive and because people shed uh, viral RNA sometimes for weeks or even months after the initial infection and because the test is so sensitive we sometimes pick up positive results in individuals who are no longer infectious. And so that can also create uh, some uh, concern amongst public health doctors. So the test requires interpretation. It requires proper collection of the right specimen. So we're looking for high quality specimens and it needs to be uh, reviewed in the context of when the individual had uh, symptoms, what was the onset of symptoms. So it's not a straightforward test. 
It's not a perfect test. It's the best test we have. It's actually not a bad test. It just needs to be interpreted correctly. The way it gets into your body through contact transmission is when essentially you touch your eyes, your nose, or your mouth. These are the mucous membranes of your face that are susceptible to infection by the virus. And so in order to prevent that from happening, you need to do two things. One is stop touching your mouth, your nose, and your eyes. And the other thing is to wash your hands because by washing your hands, you're eliminating uh, active or live virus from your hands, which then serve as a form of physical vectors to your eyes, nose, and mouth. Most viruses uh, mutate, and RNA viruses in particular, uh, some of them mutate at a higher rate. And it's normal, it's just normal part of uh, viral reproduction. And coronaviruses, uh, in particular, uh, have a relatively high uh, mutational rate because they have an enzyme that lacks basically a proofreading function. So when they reproduce, they do it not in a very precise way, and they make mistakes. And so these mutations happen all the time. Mutations in general, uh, people get very concerned about them because they don't like the term uh, mutant, they get very scared. But in general, mutations are normal for viruses. They happen all the time. Only in very, very rare situations uh, does it cause concern. And with coronaviruses, there's no evidence right now that a uh, mutation in this particular virus, SARS-CoV-2, has any uh, impact on uh, disease or control of the pandemic. We are doing our best in the labs here at uh, St. Paul's all over the province trying to get the results out as soon as possible. That being said, the testing process is complicated. There are multiple, multiple steps. And if there's a delay in just a single step, it can cause a delay in the result being reported out. In general, results are available within 24 hours. And that's very important because if results are delayed beyond a day or two days, then the ability for public health doctors to follow up, to perform contact tracing, and to interrupt chains of transmission is compromised. Staff members who have had an NP swab collected and are concerned about the result and have symptoms, well, they should stay uh, home. They should not be coming into work if they have a specimen that's been submitted for testing and they have symptoms. And uh, the best thing to do is to follow up with occupational health. It relates to the fact that PPE is specialized equipment and people need to be familiar with how to use the equipment. So how to put on the equipment, it's called donning the equipment, or how to remove it, uh, which is called doffing. And of those two, uh, doffing is critically important because if you are uh, removing the equipment improperly, it is quite likely that you will contaminate yourself. And so that is why it is very important that you get trained on how to use PPE, how to put it on, and how to remove it, and how not to contaminate yourself. The other thing is that people may use PPE correctly, but they may forget to wash their hands. And that is also critically important because as you're putting on the equipment or taking it off, you're also touching other surfaces in the environment. And so you, you need to combine PPE with good hand hygiene to protect yourself from getting the virus in healthcare settings. I think it's important to state that wearing PPE in the hospital is very important, hand hygiene is very important, but you need to also follow the public health recommendations when you leave the hospital. And when you're back at home, when you're in the community, you need to make sure that you're washing your hands and that you are not uh, gathering with uh, friends uh, unnecessarily, especially in this time when we're seeing a potential second wave. And so don't let down your guard just because you've left the hospital and you're not wearing PPE. I think uh, there's some good news on the horizon. Uh, vaccines are coming. Uh, there'll be more than one vaccine, probably in early 2021. Uh, also, rapid tests are coming. Uh, 
these are uh, antigen-based tests that are not, qu not quite as sensitive as PCR, but they will be very useful in certain situations, and they should help us interrupt transmission, which is very important, perhaps more in the community than in healthcare uh, settings. I think it is important not to be complacent. We are seeing what a second wave can uh, do to countries and to communities and to healthcare systems abroad. We do not want that to happen here in Vancouver and in British Columbia. So if you can maintain uh, adherence to all of those public health recommendations, uh, all the infection control recommendations here in the hospital, together we'll be able to limit transmission here in Vancouver and in BC and we'll be able to not just flatten the first wave but flatten the second wave. No one is really talking about that now but I think it's very important that we remain with, uh, in BC with low levels of transmission and everyone needs to do uh, his or her part. Thank you.